afternoon, everyone. Uh, everyone here is still alive, so that's good. Pardon my voice. Um, my name is Frank. I'm the Director of Web Application Security and Product Management for Application Security Products here at Qualys. Uh, we're going to be talking today um, about application security scanning. We're going to focus on REST APIs and modern web technologies and the challenges that the evolution of the web is really bringing us and the automated um, abilities to be able to automate scanning these kind of technologies. The agenda here is fairly simple. We're going to do a, a quick application security overview, give you a, a quick history review for those of you who may or may not want it. And we're going to talk about some of the newer innovations and the things that we're doing uh, to really automate application security scanning with the newer technologies. So first of all, this is a slide that I don't stop repeating. Uh, I usually throw this into um, most of my talks. Um, so one thing that is in particular is that even if your site is static and you, you don't have any back-end data to it, there's no SQL injection possibilities, let's say it's just a flat HTTP site, it still represents who you are. It represents your brand, your image. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that I only interact with in an online fashion. So I don't walk into any brick and mortar. I have zero relationships with any of these companies with the exception of an online source. Uh, Amazon, eBay, my bank, for instance, I pretty much all do everything um, in an automated fashion. So even if the flat sites were to get compromised, uh, it still reflects on your business. The other important thing that I always try to say is that you know your web applications are, are dynamic. They're fluid. They're always getting changed and updated. Um, they're always up and running, um, so your availability is going to automatically um, introduce inherent risks of having the, um, the ability to basically having people poke these at a nonstop basis. New vulnerabilities, attack methods, and exploits are, are constantly evolving. If you saw any talks that we did yesterday uh, about our integration with Bug Crowd, there's a, d a definite reason there. So we run very efficient application security scans in an automated fashion at scale. However, we don't do manual pen tests. However, so you look and you say, OK, hacker one, bug crowd, um, especially. We're, are, we're leveraging the creativity out there of these manual pen tests, and we're being able to bring that information in. So yes, the new vulnerabilities and attack methods are, are evolving. It's probably a good thing, though. And we look here, and you know, the technologies that your apps are built upon are also evolving, and that's really where we're going to uh, focus on a little bit here as well. Um, we have a need. We know that AppSec is often overlooked or neglected, and it could be for a variety of reasons. It could be for expertise. It could be because um, uptime and metrics are dictating uh, that it takes a back seat sometimes. Uh, we really need to reduce risk due due diligence. Our, any contract language will usually contain application security, but I find that it's rarely actually being executed upon unless you have more mature application security program already running to be in compliance. So we're gonna let, let, let's take a look at how the evolution of web applications and services has really evolved over the years and why it's been a challenge. So you see that the basic sites um, around 95 or so to 2002, we have this kind of classic model. Uh, and, and the classic model allows us very easy ability to crawl and navigate applications. You follow links, you crawl, you gather the data, you fuzz the parameters. It's fairly easy to find. Um, and, and that's pretty much you know, a decade worth of uh, pretty common w uh, technologies to be able to scan and use. And then we look at the, the way that it's kind of progressed in the last one or two iterations. Um, a lot more uh, Ajax. Uh, we won't really focus on Flash. This is going away for good, hopefully. A um, lot more Ajax, a lot more JSON. We have a lot of um, kind of silver light, a lot of plug-in content being delivered in frames and those kind of things. It, it, it's changing the way that content's being delivered. Then we look at the modern day kind of applications. We look at the services 
that are running RESTful APIs. We look at you know GWT, URL, URI, rewriting, a lot of frameworks, right? So Angular, React, Extension JS, Bootstrap, et cetera. A lot of single page applications. Now this brings us to a very interesting topic, right? So we're looking at these single page applications, we're looking at the various frameworks that are used, and we, we look at how our original crawlers and engines were built. We know that we built a lot of these on basic premises of being able to crawl an app, gather the data, and then fuzz from there on any parameters or injection points, any forms, any anything that you can find. However, w with a lot of your single page apps and your HTML5 and your very, very heavy services, you're also looking at, you know, you don't really have links. You have actions. The URL may not change. You can do 50 different things within one web application, but your URL never changes. So how do you gather that information? Well, there's no real easy way to do it in an automated fashion. So what we did was we, we basically took the action levels and went for a default of, like, say, three or five deep. And we record those actions as we find them with our, with our engine. We play it back, and then we fuzz from there, which is an interesting way to do it, because then you know, you, you're not focusing on one particular um, technology. You have to look to be able to support in the different ways that all of these applications handle the, the, the single page functions or the actions available. And they all do it a little bit differently. And then we come into HTML5 and being able to test embedded content and the way that, the, that videos and media are being delivered is completely different. We're not running applets. We're not loading files client side. We're pretty much delivering you that content in the dynamic page. Um, threw WebSockets in there because I was hoping that this one would go away, but it's still pervasive, <laughs> uh, especially in uh, the last couple of years. Um, and then we look at the way that we're evolving. So I put HTTP2 in there. So a lot of people are worried about HTTP2. Right now, we know that most, most places will revert back to HTTP, and we can still scan that way. But we have to be prepared to be able to test when there's no, there, when basically with the, the, the redirect or, or the support for HTTP gets moved to HTTP2. We look at IoT. IoT is an interesting thing because IoT is going to integrate our RESTful APIs most of the time. IoT is going to have web application vulnerabilities inherent because if they can't handle, if they can't handle securing basic applications, they're not going to be able to handle securing the APIs or services that those test back to. And then we look at the new uh, version of the OWASP Top 10. It's a little bit still uh, being uh, hashed out, and it's a little bit contentious at the moment because there was a lot of pro proactive controls being tried to being built in there. But we also need to be able to adjust and uh, focus on the way that we're looking for the new types of risk, and whether that's using uh, any kind of protection mechanisms, et cetera. So here's basically what I just talked about. We, we're looking at focusing on these areas. So currently, we support everything you see here. And this has been a pretty busy year uh, building in support for these kind of automated f functions. Um, so let's talk about services for one second. Um, so anyone who used a SOAP-based web service, it, it's pretty easy, right? It brings us back to that kind of the model that we had um, you know, with the flat basic being able to crawl. We pick up a WSDL file, we get the layout, we know where to go, it's great. What do we do for REST? Well, most customers that we walk into uh, don't have a Waddle file. They, they're they not using Swagger, or they might, um, but most of them are not. They're not using any kind of descriptor. We don't know what functions are available, we don't know what calls are supported, we don't know what what form or fashion we can use, put, delete, get, post, et cetera. We, we don't know. None of this stuff is defined. And this it even goes one step further than the single page applications and being able to find the actions. Now, we, we, we can't even crawl a site or look at a site to gather and record that information. So what do we do? It's an excellent question. <laughs> I'll explain in a second. Well, XML and JSON, right? So we're really seeing a shift over to JSON that also changes the way um, that we will have to scan. So some of the challenges that are inherent, right, with, with w RESTful scanning. 
We have so many variables. We don't know which ones to fuzz. They're not defined. Authentication. How are you handling authentication? Are you using tokenization? Are you using API gateways? Are you using Apigee? What are you using? You, are you just doing a curl command with a username and password? I don't know. There's many ways that the authentication. Are we handling all the frameworks? Are we handling the, the, even the API frameworks? Are we looking for these values that were traditionally not tested with our normal scanning for get and post? Um, and we have an important one here that most people don't seem to realize, is that anything that you can do on a web application for a vulnerability, it has the same capability to be exploited on your API. And that's where I was talking about the IoT. So part of our response, so part of our response here is we allowed very, very basic, and this is the first iteration. We said we allow basic, basic testing here. We put your WSDL location. If you have a Waddle file, put your Waddle file location. We'll pick it up. That's great. If not, you can actually put in manually if you have these. I, and I've seen people that actually have the, their APIs described in an Excel file or a Word document. It's crazy. I've seen it. Paste it here if you want to. Now. The best way that we currently support this is using Burt Proxy. We have integrations built in with Burt Proxy. You still are going to do manual testing. You're still going to do testing uh, uh, on, a, on a regular basis. You're going to, I'm guarantee, whoever is pen testing or doing your or manual testing on your APIs is probably using Burper's app, right? That, uh, that's probably what they're using. You can record all of that data in Burp, as you know, in your proxy tab. You can take that and simply upload the burp file. We'll use everything that was found in that proxy um, for, for your API calls and automatically test from there. Now, two other things with that. Um, if you have any kind of proxy or load balancer or, or WAF or anything else that sits there, that's also a good source to be able to take what, what is happening and what is occurring on the APIs in, in real life scenarios. Um, you can also take that information and import it in here. Now, being able to automate this also allows us to repetitively test. So if there's changes being done, we can also continue to pick up those changes and test it there. Here you can see that we're also taking what I mentioned earlier. So we're taking manual findings from Bug Crowd. We're taking automated findings here. We have the ability to import burp findings. We have this all in a central repository where we can sort, filter, and report with permissions. That means that whoever tried to hear, try, ever try to distribute a, port, a report out of burp with permissions, like it just doesn't happen. Take all of that data, dump it in here, create usage roles, create tags, et cetera, and be able to sort and see all of your information in one place and report on it with the appropriate controls built in. So I've been fortunate enough to, to work with a really great team of engineers, um, and we've responded. I know this is, this is something that I'm pretty proud of over the last year or two that we've been able to do in an automated and an effective fashion. Uh, we're, we're adapting to any new, pretty much any new frameworks, any vulnerabilities that are out there, especially the newer ones. We're staying on top of Angular, Angular 2, a lot of React I'm seeing out there lately. We're testing for every type of new vulnerabilities. And now, we, we're, we're, now when I say that, we traditionally, have, we traditionally have CVEs, things like that. But what about the vulnerabilities that are strictly you know, application layer, that are, that are logic, kind of air, uh, logic kind of vulnerabilities? Uh, we're working on a uh, more advanced polyglot or combination attacks where we're replacing you know, human logic. And we're doing a lot of this in an automated testing fashion, and we're getting better at it as we go. And a lot of these you know why we still recognize that manual testing needs to happen. We like to collaborate and keep this all together. Now, with a full-featured API, and that's an important part, because I don't know if you watched any talks before, but integrating your tools. If you have tools that don't play nice together, they're kind of useless. Having a tool that you can use with a full featured API and automate, and you can do same things that you can do through the UI is going to cut down on your time and overhead and allow your developers, who are probably more comfortable um, utilizing the API, to be able to utilize the scripts and things to, to build in these um, different kind of scans and abilities in at different types, uh, different points in the SDLC. 
And again, allowing access control and full automation API is, is we're seeing a great adoption for empowering developers instead of handing them something at the last minute. And this really allows us to do that. Full testing is, coverage is vital, right? We're looking at REST, we're looking at API, mobile, IoT, single page apps, et cetera. Now why I say that is because if you have one or two or three different technologies and you ignore um, one of these that you may not be able to have coverage for, it opens yourself up. A lot of people will say, oh, well, my mobile apps are, my IoT is tested, that's wonderful. But I'm still going back and find a vulnerability on the, on the API that it calls to to deliver the content to your phone or to any other device. And we're finding a inherent risk there that you can essentially control all of those uh, endpoints instead of just the one where you might have had the um, vulnerability. Now, what else can we do? We can integrate with WAF, right? And I talked a little bit earlier about using the API data that we have. We also have API um, outputs that can be automated. So you can automate our, uh, the data that we find and spit that out into web application firewalls. Uh, obviously, the integrations with our own WAF uh, are pretty much pr the best, top of the lines. You, it's a one click. If you find a vulnerability and you want to install a virtual patch for it, it's a one click install virtual patch. It creates a rule automatically on our WAF that blocks the attack that you found with our web application scanner. However, we also know that people have very large implementations of other kinds of web application firewalls. They might have million dollars worth of um, Imperva, F5, Citrix, et cetera. We have integrations already pre-built with those where you export our data, our findings out, and you can automatically import that data into Imperva, F5, Citrix, uh, F a couple others, and it will be able to use that to create the rules on those third-party WAFs as well. So we've already established those relationships in the maturity of our product. So a, a little bit of a tease of what's next, right? So we really want to continue support and develop and really evolve the way that you're testing REST-based APIs. We're working on a couple of things there um, to really make it a lot less effort on your part. <laughs> um, but what I can tease you about a little bit is we're looking at the CI CD models. We want to be able to automate testing in a way where every time that there's a build, anytime that anything is created, we're automatically gonna look for diffs in code and we're gonna be able to change, or excuse me, test the test for vulnerabilities on those code changes or on those various levels. We wanna utilize various different kinds of, whether it be TFS, whether it be Jenkins, et cetera. We really wanna get in and, and automate this so that the application security is being tested every time an app is changed um, or a build is executed. And with that, I'll uh, go over to some um, statistics. Now, just keep in mind that we will do application discovery, right? So application discovery, we can scan your entire environment, all your IP ranges, internal, external, and find out what applications are responding essentially to web requests and have an inventory of those. All of these solutions, all of our app suite integrate with each other. So if you know that you have specific vulnerabilities um, in VM that you want to tie to WAS vulnerabilities and be able to report back and forth, it's all there. API goes across all of our products and can be automated for all of our products. We look at analytics and reporting. Obviously what I mentioned, we have um, a, we, we, we automatically have a lot of those integrations built and being able to spit out that data. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out here too is the volume and the information that we gather. We don't have, with our suite, we don't have access to your actual data. It's encrypted, obviously, for its own good. Um, but some real quick st statistics to look at. We ran over three billion uh, scans a year. We're at about 100 billion detections per year and about a 1 trillion security events generated per year. That's a lot of metrics to be able to build and improve upon. And I just wanted to end here with this slide to basically just highlight some of the strengths of the overall platform 
in addition to the overall uh, strategy that we're using for our web application scanning product. And with that, I would love to entertain questions if anyone has a question. Um, and if you're just here for a raffle ticket, that's fine too. <laughs> Single page applications. So those are basically going to be applications that are uh, modern and written in app where essentially your URL, it doesn't, uh, it's not going to change. A lot of times you'll see you know, uh, the pound signs, uh, the, the, the uh, hashtag, et cetera, up there. And that will stay static even though what you're doing on the particular site or application is changing. You could be ordering something. You could be navigating. You could be doing whatever. But the actual path is not being represented or changes are not being represented in the, in, in the application URL. Yeah, so what that, it's a, um, so what you're going to use there is it's going to be fully your API services and being able to have um, automation talk back and forth to each other. It's the way that most applications are talking back and forth to databases, to various applications, to middleware, to platform architecture, et cetera. Those are going to be your, your calls that you can get the data from and be able to automate from. All right. Anyone has any questions, feel free to email me or grab me another time. And right now, we will do the raffle. Thank you, Frank. Frank will do the honors. It's a big one. Mix it in. 4257341. Oh, there we go. We got a winner. Yeah, you want? Yeah. Yeah, I gotta get him a bigger card. Seven, three, four, one. There we are. Yeah. Thank you, sir. What's your destiny? IPad, iPad Pro. There we go. There you go. Thank you. Thanks.